Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this session. My name is Yoshiki Tabata and works at OSS Solution Center of Hitachi. Today's session, the title is Lightweight Cell Trust Network Implementation and Transition with Key Clock and NGX. In this session, I'd like to propose a lightweight cell trust network implementation achieved by KeyClock and NGX. Actually, there are many systems to which it's a little hard to introduce service mesh because it needs which resources for its which features and affects the architecture a lot. For these systems, I propose this implementation, and I believe this is one of the easiest ways to introduce a cell trust network. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Yoshiki Tabata, and I'm a software engineer at the OSS Solution Center of Hitachi. I mainly work as a consultant for API systems, and I've built various API systems, for example, a high-security banking API system. And I'm a contributor to 3Scale, which is an OSS for API management. I've developed features around security and access control, for example, edge limiting, role-based access control, all materials, and so on. And I'm also a contributor to KeyClock. I developed features required for API use cases based on OAuth and OIDC. For example, token revocation, refresh token setting for client, and so on. So let's get started. This is today's session's overview. In the traditional API system, the security boundary between the public network and the private network is clear, so we only needed to focus on the security boundary. Inside the system is the private network, and outside the, outside of the system is the public network. API system is typically built by following OS 2.0, the de facto standard of API security. So a client application delegates authentication and authorization to the authorization server, and the client application gets an access token, and it calls the API exposed by the API gateway. API gateway access controls API calls, and if OK, proxies to resource servers. These internal communications are recognized as safe, so typically not encrypted. Previously, the components that expose API are limited, so building a security boundary is quite easy. In the world of microservice, on the other hand, various services expose their API, so it's much difficult to define security boundary between the public network and the private network. In the world of microservice, as the same as traditional API systems, we need to build an API system by following OS 2.0, so there is an authorization server. And there are many services that expose the APIs. These APIs are not only called by the client application, but also called by other services. So it's quite difficult to build a security boundary in this case. So we need to consider introducing a zero trust network to secure each service independently, for example, per service or per pod. The typical way to achieve a zero trust network is with service mesh. But actually, there are many systems to which it's a little hard to introduce because it needs rich resources for its rich features and affects the architecture a lot. So we propose lightweight zero trust network implementation, which needs fewer resources than service mesh and is easier to be introduced than service mesh. These are today's contents. First, I describe what is Zero Trust Network this session targeted. Next, I describe how to achieve the underlying technology behind the Zero Trust Network. And then I describe the transition from traditional security boundary definition to per service or per port definition. After that, I describe two additional topics. First, I describe how to achieve east-to-west traffic. Then finally, I describe how to resolve the choke point issue of policy decision point. 
So first, what is a zero trust network? What is a zero trust network is to treat the system internal network the same as the public network. This assumes that the implicit trust zone is only inside the service or inside the pod, and all networks, including networks inside the system, are not safe. The de facto standard of a service mesh is Istio, and according to Istio, the underlying technology behind a zero trust network is JOT validation and mutual TLS. Istio requires MTLS and JOT validation in the public network, and Istio only requires MTLS in the system internal network, but JOT validation in the internal network is said to be also needed among API security professionals. This is because we need to treat the system internal network the same as the public network. I describe the underlying technology behind the Zero Trust network by using the traditional API system. First, JOT validation. In the context of OS 2.0, what the JOT, which is presented during an API call, means is OS 2.0 access token. And the access token is issued by an authorization server as representing an authorization. In typical OS 2.0 authorization code flow, first, a client application delegates authentication and authorization to, an, to the authorization server. Then, the authorization server issues an access token to the client application after authentication and authorization. After that, the client application calls APIs of the API Gateway with the access token. Then, the API Gateway validates JOT. Generally, the API gateway validates the JOT with the authorization server. That is following token inspection defined by RFC 7662. What validate are, uh, for example, signature. Validating signature, we can check the JOT is not tempered. And validating expiry, we can check the JOT is not expired. Validating scopes, we can check the client was authorized to call the API. Validating audience, we can check which resource server or API gateway is intended to return the resource. This is the JOT validation. Next, mutual TLS. As the same as authenticating the server using a server certificate, authenticate the client using a client certificate. During TRS handshake, the API gateway presents its server certificate and the client application presents its client certificate. API gateway verifies the client certificate using trusted SHEA certificates. This is mutual TRS. There is another mutual TRS in the context of OS 2.0. In the context of OS 2.0, Mutual TLS means OS 2.0 Mutual TLS Client Certificate Bound Access Tokens, defined by RSC 8750, 8.705. OS MTLS can prevent access token theft. I briefly describe OS MTLS. First, when the client application delegates authentication and authorization, the client application presents its client certificate during TLS handshake. After authentication and authorization, the authorization server issues an access token, and this access token includes the hash value of the client certificate. After that, the client application calls API with the access token, and also at this timing, the client application presents its client certificate during TLS handshake. Then, API Gateway verifies the client certificate using trusted SHEA certificates, and also, the API gateway can verify that the hash value of the grant certificate equals 1 in the access token. So if an attacker gets someone's access token, since he cannot present, present its valid grant certificate, he cannot call API. And more, if extending token introspection, the API gateway can delegate Grant certificate checks to the authorization server. The below table shows 
the comparison of MTLS and OAuth MTLS. In the case of MTLS, both the authorization server and the resource server need to manage trusted SHIA certificates. But in the case of OAuth MTLS, only the authorization server needs to manage them. In the case of MTLS, we cannot prevent access token theft. But in the case of OAuth MTLS, we can prevent it. So if you publish your APIs to a large number of unspecified clients on the, on the public network, we believe all the materials may be suitable. In this session, I treat these technologies as the underlying technology behind the Zero Trust Network. Next, I describe how to achieve the underlying technology behind the Zero Trust Network. To achieve these technologies, we use KeyClock as an authorization server and NGX as an API gateway. First of all, I briefly describe what is KeyClock. KeyClock is an identity management OSS and provides OS 2.0 authorization server features. Its major features are, for example, it supports identity federation corresponding to major standards, such as OS 2.0, OpenID Connect and SAML. And it can be linked with LDAP and Active Directory. And also it supports social login, for example, such as GitHub, Twitter, Facebook. Keycloak is becoming the de facto standard of the OSS authorization server. So let's go back to the main topic. How to achieve short validation with Keycloak and NGX? Keycloak supports token introspection as a standard feature, and NGX supports the NGX HTTP auth request module, which implements client authorization based on the result of sub request. With a sub request returns like 200 response code, access is allowed. If it returns 401 or 403, access is denied with the corresponding error code. Combining these features, we can make NGX delegates short validation to KeyClock. NGX sends an introspection request to KeyClock's token introspection endpoint. And if the access token is active, NGX proxies it to the resource server. If the access token is not active, NGX denies the access. Next, how to achieve MTLS with NGX? NGX supports SSL verify client syntax, which enables verification of client certificates. And we can specify trusted CS certificates in the SSL client certificate syntax. NGX verifies client certificates using the trusted CA certificates. Then, how about achieving all materials? NGX supports the optional no CA parameter in the SSL verify client syntax which requests the current certificate to end the TRS handshake, but doesn't verify it at this time. This is intended for use in cases when a service that is external to NGX performs the actual certificate verification. The SSL client ex escaped cert variable returns the current certificate in the PEM format for an established SSL connection. So we can pass this variable's value to the external service, in this case, KeyClock. KeyClock has interfaces that extend its features called SPI. And by using SPI, we can extend token introspection to check client certificates at KeyClock. And we make NGX send the access token and the client certificate to the token introspection endpoint. This is how to achieve all awesome materials with KeyClock and NGX. So far, we can achieve the underlying technology behind the Zero Trust Network with KeyClock and NGX by using the traditional API system. From here, we transit from traditional security boundary definition to per service or per pod definition. I described the security boundary transition scenario. So far, 
we exp explained how to use KeyClock and NGX to achieve the underlying technology behind the trust network. From a macro perspective, we may be able to say that this is a zero trust network because this achieved the underlying technology, but this is not the general grain size of a zero trust network. From here, we make the grain size of the security boundary final step by step. Compared other services or products, KeyClock and NGX can achieve this transition much easier. This is also one of the main reasons why we select KeyClock and NGX. Step 1 is to change the API gateway to NGX ingress controller. First of all, lifting the existing traditional API systems to the world of containers. Compared to cloud services in NGX, this API gateway lifting is very easy because we can reuse the NGX conf file. For example, using server snippet and location snippet annotations, or using custom resources named virtual server. NGX ingress controller plays the role of API gateway that is validating JOT and verifying client certificates, and proxies API calls to the resource server services. Step 2 is to shift the security boundary to per service. This step is useful if the resource server service takes a little time to be modified to adapt it to the zero trust network. Again, in this step, we can reuse the NGX conf file. To pass through client certificates at NGX ingress controller, we use custom resources named transport server to configure stream context. This time, NGX ingress controller only passes through API calls and proxy services play the role of API gateway and proxies API calls to the resource server services. The grain size of the security boundary became finer to per service. Step 3 is to shift the security boundary to per pod. I believe this is a general grain size of a cell trust network. This is achieved by the so-called sidecar. Again, in this step, we can reuse the NGX conf file and we can reuse the transport server setting too. This time, NGX ingress controller only passes through API calls and proxy containers play the role of API gateway and proxies API calls to the resource server containers. So an API call is first sent to the proxy container, and if all checks are passed, proxy, proxy to the resource server container. The grain size of the security boundary became finer to per pod. By using KeyClock and NGX, we achieved the transition much easier like this. So, Move to additional topic 1. How to achieve east-west traffic. So far, we targeted north-south traffic that is traffic from a client application to the resource server from external to internal. The client application calls the APIs of the resource server through an NGX ingress controller and the proxy container. The east-west traffic means traffic from service to service, that is internal to internal. This traffic is needed, for example, when the resource server wants to get resources from other services. This is not so difficult. In this case, the resource server container just sends a request using, again, the proxy container. Then, how to achieve JOT validation in East-West traffic. To validate JOT, the proxy container must send JOT to another service. There are two options. Option A is to send the same access token which the client application sent to the resource server. Option B is to send the different access token which is got from the authorization server by following OS 2.0 token exchange defined by RFC 8693. For both options, we need to get the user's consent to use the access token for another service. 
for this east-to-west -west traffic case, the audience check is very important. This is because without the audience check, the user's resources may be provided to a malicious service. What is the audience check is to check which resource server is intended to return the resource. If the resource server doesn't check the audience, the resource server may return the user's resources to a malicious service because the access token attached to the API call is a valid access token. So the audience check is very important in this case. Then, how to achieve MTLS in east to west traffic? As the same in the case of north south traffic, there are two methods. MTRS and OS MTRS, but different in the case of north-south traffic. The requesting parties are limited, so MTRS may be enough, and OS MTRS may be over-engineered. We can add client certificate and a key with proxy SSL certificate syntax and proxy SSL certificate key syntax in the NGX proxy container. Finally. Additional topic 2. How to resolve the choke point issue of policy decision point. As the number of API calls increases hugely, key clock may become a choke point of this architecture because key clock is accessed by token introspection every time API calls. Following zero trust architecture defined by NIST SP 800-207, Key clock plays the role of policy ending, and NGX plays the role of policy enforcement point and policy administrator. From here, we consider how to reduce the load of PE, that is, key clock. Here, we consider using Open Policy Agent, OPA, the de facto standard OSS of policy engine. There are two options, the way to reduce the load of PE. Option A is to cache talk introspection responses. Option B is to make OPA act as PE and key clock act as just policy information point. So first, option A, casting talk introspection responses. By casting talk introspection responses, we can reduce the access frequency to key clock. When the client application calls the BI is an access token, NGX delegates JOT validation to OPA. Then OPA checks the cache, and if cache miss, OPA calls a token introspection endpoint. And after receiving the token introspection response, OPA saves the result. This can reduce the load of key clock. But even if the access token is revoked at key clock, it's not revoked at the resource server immediately because the resource server checks the cache first, and if there is the cache, the resource server doesn't call token introspection endpoint. This is a security weak point, so we should make the access token lifespan be a proper short value. Option B is to make OPA act as PE and key clock act as PIP. In this case, the OPA container become PE completely, and key clock becomes PIP, which only provides information for decisions to grant access. Not depending on the grant access, key clock notifies the change of resources. For example, user creation, grant deletion, signing a key update, and so on. This notification can be achieved by using SPI. We can extend the event listener SPI to notify operations to the com converter. Then the converter saves the data to DB. The converter can be also achieved by using OPA. When the current application calls the API with an access token, NGX delegates JOT validation to OPA. Then OPA checks DB and makes decisions to grant access. This option also can reduce the load of key clock. This is a comparison of the two options to reduce the load of key clock. Option B is an ideal implementation, but it is expensive to implement. 
Option A, on the other hand, has a security concern that access token revocation cannot be synchronized immediately, although the implementation cost is minimal. If you see these options look like little extreme ideas, a hybrid proposal can be considered. For example, the option like to cache the results of token introspection and synchronize only token revocation notifications. There are many ways to reduce the load of key clock by using OPA, so you can choose a suitable one for your requirements. So finally, this is today's session summary. The underlying technology behind the Zero Trust network is short validation and MTLS. And OSI MTLS, defined by RFC 8705, is force compatible with MTLS. By using Keycrock and NGX, we can achieve the underlying technology and transit from traditional security boundary definition to per service or per port definition smoothly. Not only north-south traffic, but also east-west traffic can be covered. And by using OPA, we can reduce the load of key clock. Finally, these are trademarks. Thank you for listening.